No president can easily commit our sons and daughters to war. They are the nation's finest. August 12, 1990. Iraq has invaded its oil-rich neighbor, Kuwait. And after receiving several warnings from the international community and the United States, Saddam Hussein would continue his push south into Kuwait. UN and US forces gathered and began Operation Desert Storm on January 16, 1991 with aerial bombings on key Iraqi targets. While the conflict may have been thousands of miles away in a distant land, several men and women watched and waited for their National Guard units to be called up for duty. One of those men was Walnut Ridge Resident Sergeant Terry W. Ward of the 875th Engineer Battalion. Sergeant Ward, among others in his National Guard unit, anxiously waited but were never called upon as U.S. and U.N. forces quickly liberated Kuwait. In 1992, Sergeant Ward was forced out of service because of a knee injury he sustained while in the service. He would receive an honorable discharge after nearly 15 years in the U.S. Army National Guard. Listen to his story of what it was like to be a citizen soldier and serve his country in this edition of Arkansas Valor. Terry Ward, E-5 Sergeant, uh, time of service, 1979 to 92. Nineteen seventy-nine. Warner Ridge, Arkansas. I was living at home at that time. Me and my twin brother, uh, and that was it at that time. Uh, it was kind of a patriotic thing. Uh, my family was made up of 18 or better uh, individuals, just got some kind of armed services behind them. Uh, that's what every, all, I guess all the family members that's what they joined was the army. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Uh, uh, Fort Leonard Wood was called uh, Little Korea back in 1979, and it was pretty t pretty tough work. Uh, the drill sergeant was pretty hard on you, but it was it was an experience. The yeah, the brotherhood, the uh, uh, making friends was was just one of the biggest things that that you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see when you join the military. Uh, boot camp was hard. AIT was, was more uh, classroom work. Uh, back in 1979 when I joined, it was called combined dosiates. Uh, combined dosiates meant that we, it was basically a, a, a real quick, uh, basic AIT to get you in and get you out. Uh, Drill Sergeant Jackson was one of the the one I really do remember. Uh, he was uh, he was really thorough and hard core, but he was uh, he was something to, he was someone to to look up at. Uh, basically, it was it was the friend that you made during basic NIT because we all had to pull together as as one unit, as one body. So that's how a lot of people made it through uh, basic AIT. So in other words, you were only as strong as your weakest one. That's right. Uh, we never went overseas, we were stateside. We, uh, Army National Guard, is that's exactly what that is. They stay stateside uh, unless
unless a major conflict occurs. Now here lately, uh, the National Guard makes up more than 50% of the unit uh, anywhere right now. So uh, the Army National Guard does play a big, uh, uh, big part in the military now. The first day back out of AIT, or basic, basic training AIT, uh, back of my unit, which was Jonesboro, uh, the unit was 875th Engineer Battalion. Uh, I met some real good friends there, uh, friends that had been, been through the same training that I'd been through, so uh, it was easy to, uh, to uh, get along with the folks in, in the S3 shop. S3 shop is operations of the whole whole battalion. Uh, I worked with the officers as far as uh, plotting missions for Alpha Company, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Uh, we were the backbone of making all the decisions of what what uh, each company done during uh, training uh, training uh, uh, during AIT. Yeah, it was it was called headquarters headquarters company, 875th Engineer Battalion, uh, 5th Armored Division. Uh, later on, uh, down the through the years, uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, the 875th went uh, mechanized. Uh, but at the time when I was in it, there was no APCs or anything like that. But now, uh, at this moment, they have APCs. Of course, they're mechanized. They're there to uh, to back up any other thing that's going on in the world. My job was combat engineer, combat 1210. Uh, what that meant was that we were also, our jobs were engineers, but we also had combat training uh, behind us because of course you had to be able to uh, uh, put up a perimeter and also uh, have guard duty and everything else. In 1990 or 91, we were on alert for uh, Gulf War. Uh, I remember our unit commander uh, talking about it. We was getting our, our stuff together, getting it packed prior to going if we had to be mobilized. Uh, our initial uh, word was if, if the section sergeant called you at work and they gave you a, a uh, I forget how you would put it, uh, like the, the, the cow is grazing, that meant that we were on standby. So the next time they would call you, you would, of course, you would leave your place of employment or wherever you were at, and then you would uh, report in the Army National Guard there and get ready to be mobilized. Oh, yeah, we had, I had a good employer. Uh, matter of fact, my boss was uh, ex-Navy. So he, he totally understood. No, I, I think, well, I think there was there in the beginning, but as time went on, we finally realized that we weren't going to be mobilized. But there was always that probability, and it, it still is any time that you're in the Army National Guard or Reserves, there is that possibility to be mobilized. All the time, always had a good relationship with company commanders. Uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, my first few years in the Army National Guard, I was a Jeep driver for the company commander. Uh, the one that I could just distinctly remember and really looked up to was uh, Lieutenant Swan. Uh, he was one of those type of gentlemen that, that was gung-ho about what he was doing. Uh, he wanted his company to be just as sharp as he was, uh, but I think at this particular time, he is now a Brigadier General in uh, Little Rock. No, the most we stayed away was two weeks uh, out of the year. Uh, we'd go to uh, Little Rock for training, uh, Fort Hood, um, and then we'd have like a three-day FTX as far as weapon qualifications once a year.
Uh, the barracks back in Garrison, the food was good, uh, but as far as out in the field, uh, the sea rations back uh, back in the 79 and the mid 80s, uh, they were really good. I enjoyed those. But then the military changed from sea rations to MREs. Uh, MREs wasn't delicious <laughs> by no means. You just <laughs> had to inquire the taste in order to have something to eat. But no, uh, the uh, the sea rations were the best out, out of all of it I, I enjoyed. Uh, prior to going to the field, uh, we'd stay in garrison for a week. And of course that meant you stayed in the barracks, you went to the mess hall. But after that particular week, then you'd go to the field. So uh, all that uh, uh, cafeteria food stopped. Yes, we did. We had everything we needed to uh, do our uh, Pacific uh, job and, and uh, get our training across. Uh, yeah, during the, yeah, during the uh, FTX, of course, uh, during annual training a year, uh, it, sometimes it did get stressful because your hours were, uh, well, there was no set hours that you would work. Uh, and also, you had to work with the officers, so you had to be on your toes and, and do the best job that you knew how to do. Along with pulling guard duty, uh, that was a part of everybody's job other than working their own particular job. Uh, well, I guess it was, was laxed, but then again, on the well, on the downtime it was, uh, you were able to go to your, to your place to where as far as your tents, uh, to where you stayed together and you slept together basically on, on cots. Of course, it wasn't a comfortable time because it was held during the summer months, but uh, we all got through it. We all uh, pulled together as a unit and uh, it was a successful uh, a, uh, annual training. Pretty much, yeah. Alcohol was pretty common back in the in the late seventies and eighties, uh, and, and and smoking. But now that was done off duty, of course. Uh, you couldn't do that on duty uh, by no means. And, uh, and there's restrictions uh, that you had to to go along with. But yeah, there was uh, not a, just a whole lot of uh, uh, bad drinkiness. But yeah, there were there were times that we could sit back and have a beer. but I did wake up one morning with M&Ms on my forehead and on my face, and, uh, which I never did find out exactly who done that. Got a good idea. <laughs> well, at the time, my nephew, Dwayne Paris, was, was serving in the same unit, and I think he was the corporate behind it all. I never pulled no pranks on nobody. It was all on me as far as I can remember. Uh, I think I'm being honest. And I said, I think. <laughs> no, nothing like that. Uh, we'd only, we'd, we'd make our own entertainment. Uh, I remember specifically one time we'd, me and a couple of guys, a friend, a good close friend of mine in the guard, we went to this one place called the, the, the Crossroads and uh, they had a gong show going on at that particular time, and I particularly won that gong show and got a trophy that said, gong show on it. <laughs> I worked at Rice and Foods for 30 years. Uh, the last several years that I did work for Rice and Foods, I was supervisor in clean rice shipping. But yes, that's what I did uh, outside of the, the Army National Guard. There was times that was hilarious when it was raining real bad and got muddy and, and you'd look at your, your, your partner next to you and you'd think uh, they'd been rolling in the mud all day long. But yeah, that was some of the, the fun times and exactly, you know, especially when you can look back and say that it was, it was fun.
I worked under, of course, the section sergeant, which was L.M. Duncan. He was staff sergeant at the time. Real close friend of mine. He had served 20 years plus in the Army National Guard and finally retired out. But uh, we had one particular person, basically a staff sergeant to answer to. No, I've got several pictures over the years that that show us, uh, actually shows me practically growing up from the time I was 18 year old until the time I was discharged. So it, it is uh, something to look back on when you start thinking about your military times. Uh, yeah, the day, of, uh, the day my service ended was I believe in 1992. Uh, prior to that particular year, I'd injured my knee uh, to where it, it kept me from doing my physical training activity. So, therefore, I was discharged out. Uh, I believe I liked uh, five or six months of, of having a total of 15 years of service. But, yeah, that was one of the disappointing times of my military career. Uh, no, I uh, practically went to uh, troop command out of Little Rock, and they were the ones that uh, uh, gave me the discharge. And I believe it did to a certain point uh, because my mind was made up to to make a career out of it, uh, and uh, of course I did enjoy the years that I did put in and what I did accomplish. But yes, my intentions were to have 20 years plus. Yeah, I believe I could, I could have continued serving, uh, but during that time, of course, you have rules and regulations, and if you don't meet those uh, criteria points, then, then you have no other choice but, but to be discharged. Uh, yeah, my, my experience during boot camp especially, uh, when we had an opportunity before we had left uh, Fort Leonard, Missouri, we was asked at that particular time if we wanted to change over from Army National Guard to active Army. That's where I I'd, I'd totally messed up. I wished I had I went ahead and, and took that opportunity to go active army and stayed 30 years. I, I no, I didn't normally stay in touch with them other than uh, I kept them in the back of my mind, which one of them was Sergeant Jerry Brown. Uh, he was uh, he was a good close friend and uh, Sergeant Hogan uh, he he was a, a good close friend too. Uh, it was sad to hear later on before or shortly after he retired, he had passed away with, with cancer. LM and I have been friends probably 30 years. Uh, I got to know LM back in 1979. Uh, we kind of uh, kind of got along together pretty quick and we kind of just, uh, uh, anytime you saw LM, you saw me or, so we, yeah, he was, he was a good close friend. Uh, yeah, they was some of those days that we'd put under our belts that that we did do, but but uh, we finally grew out of that mess. For the sake of uh, your church families today, it's probably best to leave those sickers alive. Exactly. <laughs> American Legion. And how long were you a part of that? Uh, probably about a year, year and a half, uh, until it kind of got hard to make the meetings. Uh, they were located in Jonesboro, and I, of course, I lived in, in Warner Ridge. No, I haven't. Is this something you'd be looking forward to? Uh, there's times I've thought about meeting some of the guys over at a restaurant in Jonesboro. They meet, uh, I think, once every other week or so, but I have thought about that. Uh, well, it affected my life with the fact that it gave me the prestige of knowing that uh, I'd served my country, even though I was never deployed, 
uh, I still wore the uniform and also made the rank of, of Sergeant E5. So yes, it played a big part in my life all the way around. You know, at the age of 18, of course, that was real young back back in 79 or, uh, you know, going through boot camp and AIT. And that's one sure way of, uh, of uh, them giving you discipline and making you become a, a man at, at an early age. Well, I think this, I think if, if you're a young, if you're a young lad, uh, 17, 18 year old, and uh, you want an experience that will last a lifetime, uh, the Army, Navy, Marines, whatever it might be as far as any service connected thing would be the best thing in the world you would ever do. Something you would never look back on and say you regretted. Uh, it's, it's an honor and a privilege that a person can do that, uh, where there's a lot of people that don't get an opportunity to uh, serve their country. So I think it's a, paper, uh, a fine thing for a young man to do. and thank you for watching Arkansas Valor presented by T Word Media. If you or someone you know is the relative of a veteran or a veteran themselves that would like to speak to us about their service to our nation or their service abroad, we would like for you to contact us at the information below. Contact at twardmedia.com. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us at Twitter for the up-to-minute information on projects that we're working on including Arkansas Valor and those who will be featured on our next interview. We are so proud to talk to our nation's veterans, to speak to them about their service, to speak to them about their sacrifices during wartime and during peacetime. We can never repay the debt that our veterans have given this nation, from those who have sacrificed their lives to those who have sacrificed pieces of themselves. We are eternally grateful and blessed to call you our nation's veterans. On behalf of all of us at T-Word Media, God bless you, and thank you for watching Arkansas Valor.